Good afternoon and welcome to Encore. And today we're going to be looking at the work we've been doing on our assets. And by assets, I mean the, the people kind and of the physical kind. So for those of you who have been around the festival, you'll know that the festival is a brilliant ideas generation engine. Um, we, we typically generate about 40, 50 ideas out of the sprints and hacks that we run at the festival. So this year we ran, I think, about 31, 32 different sprints. That's that translates to 31 different problems. And then the ideas that come out of that, we take back into our business and we work hard at progressing those ideas to value. And so the idea of Encore uh, is to give you all a window in on how those ideas are progressing, what's happened since July in, in a nutshell. And so <clears throat> this is the fourth in a series of five. Uh, we've already had a look at uh, what happened to the ideas around the sort of the clean water area, water wonders. We did that on the 1st of November. Then we looked at customer heroes on the 7th of November. Enviro Warriors last Friday on the 11th. Today, like I said, it's awesome assets. And then on, on this Friday, the 18th, we've got the encore of encores, if you will, on smart tech. And so we organise our sprints into these different bubbles. <clears throat> and the easiest way is to Give you a bit of a download on everything that's been going on in the bubble. So we've got um, some great people who are going to give you updates on their ideas. Some of them would have progressed very quickly, some not. That's um, life in the world of innovation. As a reminder, we're expecting to uh, take four ideas out of ten through to value. Um, and so, you know, there might be some things in here that will fall by the wayside in, in the fullness of time. But <clears throat> so that's a bit of background. Um, just to take your minds back to uh, the festival, which seems like quite a long time ago. We were there back at the Newcastle race course for a brilliant event, and it was so good to be back in, in person. And we had more than 2000 people joining us from 38 different sectors and from 33 different countries. So we really worked hard to try and keep that global perspective that, that was something that we built during um, during the COVID years, as it were. We had over 600 different organizations and 600 of our staff joining us at the festival. We had a number of firsts. Um, we had some sprints led by other water companies that those were first. So Thames, Yorkshire and Southern joined us for that. And I might say if there's anybody tuning in from another water company, our door is very much open. Um, we did a sprint in conjunction with the nuclear sector, which was also a first. And so these are every year we're looking to do something different with the festival and so if you've got any ideas or things that you want to uh, us to work on in 2023 then again please do let us know but for now what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to some some people i'm going to turn over to angela here in a minute uh, and um, we're going to get an update on what we did at innovation festival 2022 angela thanks nigel we're really excited to have um both the uh, awesome assets and the people power uh, teams with us today. But before we kick off and uh, hear about the projects, I'm going to hand over to Manisha, who's going to say a few words about innovation. Thanks, Angela. So great to, to be here and uh, in fairly new to uh, Northumberland Water myself. I'm the assets director. I've uh, been here six months and innovation for me walking into this company has been fantastic. You know, just embracing all the new stuff, not just uh, technology, but process and a really different way of thinking. And, and why is uh, awesome assets as an innovation sprint really important to me? You know, it's good asset management. We spend money, you know, customers money in a regulated environment. Um, and really what I want for us is to be able to drive those assets as far as possible and get them to work for as long as possible. Um, so it's about giving our assets a voice and to be able to give them what they need to be able to sustain themselves for as long as possible. That's one area. Uh, I'm quite passionate about carbon culture as well, especially a lot of our capital investment is going into building up the um, the concrete jungle. And I'd like to be doing away with things like that. So I'm really pleased that the team are, are looking at a different way of doing things in terms of net zero. And I'd like us to push that agenda. Uh, there's so much I can talk about when it comes to assets, but I think with that, I'm going to hand over to Kay to talk to you about the people. And I'm equally um, passionate, but in uh, a slightly different way. We've um, used the Innovation Festival now for a number of times 
to um, really think differently about issues which don't have an obvious solution. And it's brilliant to get um, ideas from lots of different people at different levels of their, of their careers, at different um, times in their lives, uh, to give their contribution and to, to add some value. And we've got um, a couple of things we're going to talk about um, today, both of which benefit hugely from uh, this approach. So with no further ado, I think I'm back to you, Angela. Thank you, Manisha and Kay there. Um, so just before we kick off and dive into the innovation projects that happened at the 2022 festival, I always think it's quite interesting to have a little bit of a cast back at, at what else has been going on in this space. And in our innovation pipeline at the moment, we've in the asset space, we've got 10 live projects which are potentially worth over nine million pounds to our business should they succeed. So this innovation in this space is hugely important. I think that uh, the asset space is one of our biggest challenges that we're facing. We have a lot of assets. Uh, it is an aging base of assets. And we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that our products and services are resilient and reliable for the future. And we're doing this in the face of climate change. So more than ever, we really need to look to the future and, and come up with some innovative ways to, uh, to look after this asset base as best as we can. And I couldn't not mention the National Underground Asset Register when I talk about the, uh, the past wins that we've had from our Innovation Festival. It came out of our first ever event. It was an idea that popped out of three different sprints, but it was difficult to actually make any real progress on it just because of the complexities involved. So that also gave birth to our first year's worth of work in a week where we got identified the pain points. We got the right people in the tent. And one of those was the data sharing aspect of this, you know, which is, you know, no, no mean feat to get over. So with the help of the, the lawyers from the various different parties already within a week, we had that agreement. We had Sunderland prototyped. And over the years, it's gone from strength to strength with getting a significant government funding. And now, by, probably by March 2023, that will all be completed and the, the map will be alive and kicking and ready for everybody to use. So it just goes to show what can happen when you get the right people in the right space with the will to change the future and to do things differently. So we're incredibly proud of that particular project. But we also have uh, have some other really big uh, projects that have come out of previous events. So in 2019, we have the Power of Z um, project, which uh, was helping us get the depth data required to make our databases more robust. Uh, we also have from the 2021 festival uh, tipping point um, uh, assessment model. And we're really excited about the potential of that particular idea. And we're really building momentum behind growing what that could actually do for us. We also have um, Ken, I'm not going to ruin his thunder from, uh, from what he's going to share today, but out of this year's festival, again, we worked with the nuclear sector and are working on some really incredible things around asset health. So we're very, very excited about that. We also had some things that actually came out of the event live. Uh, so we had the Dave app that's helping us get uh, some data that we didn't even know that we could actually join up so seamlessly. And already during that festival week, we actually had some meaningful uh, dashboard of uh, of energy usage, which is helping us again manage our assets better. And I could really go on and on here, but in uh, I want to flip gears just a little bit and focus on the people. And this is something that uh, I'm hugely passionate about because we wouldn't have any innovation or anything without absolutely passionate and wonderful people actually coming up with the ideas and really having the, uh, the resilience and the perseverance to make some of these projects happen. And we've always had very strong people focus within the festival. That that could be that we've actually had some sprints looking at uh, various uh, employee activities in order making that experience better, whether it be um, in the office or for our field base employees. We also have um, health and safety, a very, very key pillar to all of our business. We like really passionately believe that everybody should go home safe and in the condition that they came to work. And we've had a number of activities that are looking to see how we can actually do that even better, looking at some, some different apps to see how we can uh, bring that to life even more. Wellbeing has also been a key part of the festival. We have physical and mental wellbeing activities that are, that are uh, throughout the event. 
And then one of the things that was kicked off in the 2020 event was our inclusive innovation, recognizing that how everybody wants to do it is a little bit different. Some people can react to the fast pace and get energy from that. Other people want to take a little bit of time and want to reflect and to do it differently. And we want to make sure that everybody who comes along has a good experience and has an ability to uh, to work the way in which they feel most comfortable and gets the most out of them and obviously is an enjoyable experience for everybody. We also ran our first uh, live experiment at the festival, understanding which innovation archetype we are. So assets and people is a great combination and we're going to dive in now and hear more from the teams who've actually brought some of those projects to life during this year's event. So I'm going to hand over to Ken Black, who's going to share more about prescription technology sprint. Hello, thank you, Angela. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you about what happens briefly at the uh, festival of, on the prescription sprint and then talk a little bit about what work we've done since then. So it's really good sprint. Um, we had 60 people in the tent, I think, for most of the days, and uh, representatives from across the supply chain, um, also from other water companies um, and representatives from, as Angela and Nigel uh, intimated before, from the nuclear industry, both in Stellarfield and also the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, because they share similar issues regarding asset health. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, asset health and why we're interested in it. So we've got 28 billion pounds worth of assets roughly uh, spread across the northeast of England and also Essex and Suffolk. And those assets range from things like uh, impounding reservoirs that you'll all probably be familiar with um, and you probably spent nice days out at Kilda for example, um, right the way through to pipes under the ground, um, uh, treatment works, water treatment and sewage treatment works and also pumping stations. So really diverse range of assets geographically spread and, and our asset base has built up over many, many generations really. We've got Victorian stuff out there still um, working really well, um, but we've also got um, buildings on treatment works which are 160 years old um, and we've, we've right the way through to plants that we've just built in the last year or so. We're constantly changing and, and, and managing our asset base. So, so in a nutshell, it's quite difficult to know uh, what condition all of those assets are in. We have to work quite hard just to understand that. And that can be quite a, a, an intensive process trying to understand the, the health of our assets. And we've got to, in the same way as we, we have to be efficient um, when, we, when we produce water, we, we need to also be efficient when we try to understand what our assets uh, are doing and we need to be we need to be accurate. So so the sprint really focused around um, well how can we do this better? How can we do it for, for less cost and how can we ensure that we can get as much coverage of our asset base as, as we can? So effectively the sprint um, uh, came up with a proposal for going for additional funding from the Offwat Innovation Fund. Um, and we've done that now, literally last week, we sent off the stage one bid. Um, so, so basically what, what, what I've done is pull together all the great ideas that came from all the contributors at the festival. Uh, and, and we've done a little bit more work on the ground to test some of those ideas. So we're not just going forward with a you know, we would like to look at all technologies that are out there. We're trying to narrow it down and actually prove some of them. Um, and we've got we've got sufficient of those now to move it forward. So in a nutshell, I think our innovation has got clear benefits for the customer. And that's the key message from from us. There's no point in just doing innovation for the sake of innovation. It's got to have benefits for the customer and the environment and society in general. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So so I think if we don't understand the health of our assets there is danger that we take uh we, we'll, we'll we'll end up with lumpy investment profiles so when if we just react to things when they happen they can happen whenever they happen what we what we've got to do is anticipate when they're happening and try to smooth the the the, the intervention strategy uh, that could be investment or it could be remediation or or it could be uh, replacement um, but we need to understand how that's going to impact on customers' bills because we don't want to have bills going up and down. So, so one of the clear benefits from, from this is to ensure that we have a, a certain future for our customers, both in terms of service, 
but also in terms of value for money and cost on, on the bill. So the second clear benefit is if we understand the health of our assets, we produce, our service will be uh, resilient and that will reduce the risk to uh, human health and the environment where we operate. And the third point, the third benefit, and this is the one that really lights my boat, if you like, is we'll be transferring less of a financial burden onto future generations. So the assets that we looked at predominantly in, in the sprint were long life assets. So these are these are things that don't break very often, but when they do break, uh, the impact is, uh, is, is, is potentially large and the cost is large. So you can imagine if concrete structures and buildings start to deteriorate, the, the, the cost of fixing those is, is really high. But what you can do with long life assets is not invest in them for years and years and years and then wait until such times as you need to. And that can cross the generation divide uh, and effectively uh, means that our children and our grandchildren's water bills will be significantly higher than, than ours. Uh, and that's something that the industry is very aware of now. <clears throat> So briefly, uh, the bid that we've put into off what is, is for a bid for around £5.7 million pounds over five years, hopefully starting in the, on the 1st of June 2023. Um, the, the, we've, we've got a number of partners uh, involved in that, but I, I need to add at this point as well, the innovation seed funding um, that we received a couple of years ago now, um, really did set, uh, plant the seed for some for the, the big ideas that are coming out of this sprint, the technology, um, the technical solutions. So we received £30,000 worth of funding to do some work with Northumbria University, looking at some novel geophysical uh, techniques. Um, and they've proved really, really uh, to be beneficial for looking at concrete structures, not surprisingly. So we, we've basically got uh, it's a quite a big project. We've got 11 partners and, and they, I won't go through all of them, but the key points are we've got supply chain and, and the people we often work with, the likes of Jacob Stantec and Atkins. Um, we've also got other water companies, so Anglian United Utilities and Welsh are involved from the English and Welsh contingency, but we've also got Scottish Water involved in that. And, and we've also got Sellafield. So Sellafield are going to contribute to financially and also from an asset management uh, perspective uh, to the project. Uh, key part for me, we've also got academics involved. So I, I come, I'm an ex-academic, I guess, myself a long, long time ago. And I sometimes think we overlook the value that universities brings personal thing. We, we rely very much on supply chain when actually there's lots of really good ideas in universities, but they don't quite get to fruition because they they end up with in PhDs, but and they end up with blue tapped uh, solutions on pipes and pumps that don't get taken to the next stage. So that's one of the key things that we're, we're looking at here. So the guys we're working with have got a big, a good background in geophysics and also highways uh, uh, structures. So very, very similar uh, at Northumbria Uni. Um, and we've also got a kind of a, an interesting partner in FIS 360 uh, who, who are a bit of a brokering organisation, really. What they look to do is, is try to link the kind of academic research to small and medium sized enterprises who can potentially for a very, you know, in, for a very low amount of money can be really agile and really efficient and generate things that can be used actually on site. Uh, safely uh, from blue tack solutions in laboratories. So I'm really looking forward to working with those people to see how how we how we can innovate in that space. So um, we'll so we're we're going to be delivering through multi sector innovation. We'll be pooling the resources of academics and the agile businesses. We're going to be adapting near market technologies to the needs of the water, nuclear, and environmental industries. And, and collectively, all those players have got £300 billion worth of assets. Um, and, and we're going to use those assets in, uh, to demonstrate uh, how we can best measure asset health, predict how it's going to deteriorate into the future, and also re reporting asset health, which is in itself is a challenge because uh, we, we need to report that at various levels from the, from the site operator right the way through to the board level. So I'm hoping uh, out of this out of this project, we'll we'll end up creating and commercialising a suite of products which is scalable across the sector and and and, and to other sectors. 
So I think I've probably talked too much. Um, I'll, 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 I wasn't going to go through too much of the details of the project, but we we have been very careful. We need to we need to adhere very closely to off what's key themes. Uh, and there's two themes that that are uh, in the in the innovation space that off what are really keen on, and so are we. Um, one is delivering long term resilience and understanding infrastructure risks to customers and the environment and finding solutions to mitigate against these in sustainable ways. Really important. Again, great that off what are looking at the long term here. And the second one is testing new ways of conducting core activities to deliver the service customers and societies need, expect and value now and in the future. So that's going to be a key part of the project. Um, there, are, there are technologies out there that can measure asset health, but they're often you know, very specialist uh, bits of kit or they involve really specialist people, uh, civil engineers, structural engineers, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we've got technology now. And if we couple that with computer science, we can operationalize uh, the, the understanding of how we understand asset health. So we can actually simplify methodologies that an operator can do as part of his or her daily routines and therefore not need to, to hire in expensive people for campaigns because that and that means we'll be able to get more of a coverage. So I'll, I'll not talk any more. I think I've probably talked enough. I think that we have a clear plan to deliver through off what we'll find out in December if we've got got through stage one. Um, we, we're going to identify technologies and techniques for measuring, predicting and informing asset health. We're going to engage existing innovators for a shortlist for trials. And then we're going to deploy the successful trial uh, equipment and methods to our large scale on our demonstrator projects. And from that, we're going to develop commercialization and training plans. So in summary, as a sector, we need to understand our assets well to look after them. I think I've made that case clearly. Understanding health is difficult because of the, the asset base that we've got and quite often methods that we've got are outdated and expensive. Other sectors have got technologies which could be tailored to our needs. I know they have. I've seen them and we're going to we're going to apply them. And we've got a strong team. And I think this is the key part. We've got a strong uh, multi sector team and a good plan to trial these technologies and deliver improvements to our customers and to our environment. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very comprehensive update there, Ken. Uh, if uh, I really wish you all the best with uh, with what sounds like a, a really strong and very compelling uh, bid. So uh, so we'll keep everybody in touch with with how we get on with that. And it's a, a testament to a brilliant output from the festival and also great what collaboration can do. I absolutely love that we're working uh, with uh, another sector on on a, on a shared challenge. So now I'm going to hand over to Steve Robson, who's going to share more about the HMS sewer um, sprint that happened at this year's festival. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Stephen Robson. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about um, HMS sewer, which is a hybrid mapping of uh, sewers. Um, we came together back in the back in the summer. It seems quite quite a long time ago now. Um, to look at how we can map our network in a, in a better way. Now, currently, um, we have about 50% of our network which is not mapped. And of that 50% of the network currently in Northumbrian Water, we, we're predicting that 70% of our sewer flooding occurs on that network and about 80% of our blockage, our sewer blockages. So it's quite a big number in terms of having an impact on network which is not mapped, which seems a bit crazy, really. In terms of where we are and trying to trying to as a business. So six we've got 16,000 kilometers of sewer that's currently networked um, which is mapped um, and it we came together with Yorkshire Water and um, Southern Water. We also had other water companies uh, in the room as well, United Utilities and Welsh and along with one spatial who were um, our partners in within the festival. We looked at how we could come up with a, a hybrid mapping tool to assist us with mapping our network in a better way. So currently we spend about £900 a day if we were going to map on, on, on spec and that's a physical activity where we would have to go to sites and look at a number of properties, do lots of door knocking, having interactions with customers um, and obviously that's quite intrusive and it's quite labour intensive 
um, and not really practical. So we, we, we thought about how we could do this in a, in a better way by coming together with some different partners. That's been really successful. We've been having weekly meetings together uh, with the team, uh, looking at how we can pull things in, looking at how what other contractors we have, which could offer a service to us. Um, and we had a meeting last week down in Cambridge at one spatial office um, where we uh, came together and came up with ideas of how we can take this forward for a catalyst funding bid, um, York, which Yorkshire Water are going to lead, Thomas Ogden. So Vicky, I don't know if you just want to come in on that one. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, so I'm Vicky and I'm a senior account manager for One Spatial. And what we did last week in Cambridge is we had six water companies in the room who are all going to go together with our off what um, breakthrough challenge bid, uh, the Catalyst Stream. And we also had some suppliers. We've worked with Northumbria before on inferring their network and we estimated um, the length of your sewers to be, I think Steve said, 50% more than what you've got. But then this could be even more and we'd like to because everyone's like saying oh inference inference i don't like inference it's all scary but we're like oh no inference is great but how can you make that great into even greater is where one spatial are coming from so we're doing this hybrid mapping approach where we're working with apem who are an aerial survey company and they're going to fly um these areas and sort of identify the the manholes in your back garden um, so we can provide validation that this inference is in the right place. And then we're also going to use um, Cyclomedia, who are a LIDAR company, and they will drive the streets and so they can pick up downpipes and they can also pick up assets on the ground. Um, so we've got it as being a two year project, but the only, I mean, this is fascinating to me because the slight bother is the flights can only fly. Um, well, the best time for the flights to fly is um, when there's no trade cover. So we've got like a sort of February, March um, window to, to fly. And obviously the off what funding isn't going to come in till the end of March or something, because assuming we get it, of course. But then um, we can use flights that have already been done before. So we, we've already got some data that we can use. And then what we could also do is fly over the summer when it's in full leaf. And then we can fly in autumn when there's leaves on the ground as well, just to see like how much difference the leaf cover makes and everything like that to try and build more innovation into the side of things and also that affects the cyclomedia data as well so it's a brilliant project really excited to be involved in it and um, looking forward to getting the all the bid papers in or the application papers in and um, getting it off our plates next in the next three weeks over to you steve yep i think I think that kind of sums up where, where we are in terms of the, the bid and where we are with HMS. So it's a really exciting project. Um, and let's see, see where we get to with it. Yeah, thank you both very much for that update. Um, really exciting that we have yet another project that is going to be uh, going through to an off what bid. Uh, and already you've done uh, stacks of work uh, since the festival in order to get to this particular position. So that's excellent. I loved that uh, Yorkshire Water and Southern Water were co-leading this with us at the festival. Uh, and I would love to see more of this uh, in the future. So that's brilliant. So I'll have fingers crossed you've got a little bit more of heavy lifting to do uh, to get yourself to the December date, but I'm sure that it will be uh, successful. So fingers crossed for that and we'll keep everybody in touch with uh, where we net out with that one. So now uh, we're going to move on to the Carbon Culture Club um, uh, sprint that was led by um, uh, Esh Stantec and we have Moira Lenahan who's going to give us an update on that one. Hi, thanks very much, Angela. I'm Maura Lennon. I'm from Eshtantec and I am joined with Ben Gilbert today from Northumbrian Water to talk about our carbon culture sprint from the festival 2022. Um, I'm going to talk about what we did at the sprint and then Ben is going to join all the dots and tell you what we've been doing ever since. So this actually started in Innovation Festival 21, where Eshtantec together with Northumbrian Water led a sprint called How to Reduce Carbon from Capital Delivery. What we learned this year was that people and collaboration were key to creating the culture, environment, systems, processes and transformation to drive the change that is required to reduce carbon and achieve net zero. After this great work in 2021, we were keen to evolve our sprint around people and culture, so we created the Carbon Culture Club. And in 2022 sprint, we asked, how might we embed a carbon conscious culture into capital delivery to help us achieve net zero? 
After the success of our 21 sprint in bringing in local, national and international knowledge and expertise, we made the decision to continue with an online format for 22. We knew we didn't have to start from scratch in tackling carbon culture, as transformative work has taken place in our industry for decades, particularly in relation to health, safety, well-being and diversity and inclusion. So we brought in experts who'd led this change to present at our sprint and share what they have learned through their respective transformation journeys. They told us about what they needed for success, such as leadership commitment, engaging campaigns and training, partnerships and embedment in culture. The benefit of hosting the online sprint was that international participants could attend without any carbon impact, of course, and Stantex Director of Water and Environment in Australia joined us to present on the climate crisis being experienced in Australia from bushfires and floods to drought, and how the Australian water industry has subsequently accelerated their commitment to net zero as a result of, of this extreme weather, and how this is also driving a change in their political climate. At the end of our sprint, we identified what we needed, and this included visible senior leadership and support, an embedded carbon reduction approach in capital delivery, a network of carbon champions, a carbon culture change program, a carbon conscious thinking approach, carbon awareness, education and training, strong communications and engagement strategy. We brought our thinking from the online sprint to the race course on a stand in the exhibition hall and we asked participants what they thought of our ideas. And I'm now going to hand you over to Ben who's going to tell you all about what we've been doing since. Yeah, thanks very much Moira. Um, I think the sprint that we uh, were concluded at the festival this year was absolutely fantastic and hopefully that's give everyone a really good potted summary of, of kind of how how the week went um it's an area that myself and Moira are hugely passionate about as well as the wider team who are working on this this project since the the festival um for us you know the climate crisis is a huge environmental challenge you know bigger than any any other um that anyone sort of known like it in terms of the wider environment but for a water company, it's got a unique perspective as well. We firmly believe that this is rooted in our abilities to provide our basic day to day services. You know, we're we're heavily linked in with the environment as a water company. Um, so, you know, not only do we have to to kind of do our part in terms of our emissions from our capital works, which is the focus of what we've looked at, but, you know, from a business resilience point of view, this has huge links and that's why we really need to have our eye on the long term. Um, on how this is going to affect our ability to provide our customers with with drinking water. So we're taking we've took a lot of that passion to uh, the time post festival, and I'm really pleased to say, uh, kind of reflecting on the work that we've been doing for this for this call today, it's been you know absolutely fantastic. Um, the two sprints that we've delivered over the last couple of years um, have all come together, and uh, one of the biggest areas that we've set our sights on uh, following the festival this year was around culture and behaviours and just how key that part of this whole journey will be um, has really kind of opened our eyes to to this behaviours piece which is I think um, maybe something in addition to what a lot of people consider when we start thinking about carbon it can be quite data heavy but really the behaviours are what will bring this to life so a big piece of the work since the festival has been taking all of the outputs from both sprints that we did um, and distilling that down into a strategy to complement the the strategy that Northern Remote has around net zero um, for capital delivery. So that strategy I'm really pleased to say has been drafted. It's been a really good team effort um, to get that to a point where we can start to really embed carbon as a decision making metric within our projects. How my, how we do that has been sort of a, a something that we've had to put a bit of a bit of grey matter into and really think about through overlaying our end to end delivery process and identifying our governance gateway points, our touch points for designers, for people who are going to be building the works, so everybody can really have an input into our into our net zero journey from a project start to its ultimate handover um, into a business as usual asset. We've so that strategy has been drafted <clears throat> um, and we are now kind of in the in the final stages of just reviewing that and break, making sure that it's it's as right as it can be um, before we start a really, really big engagement piece with stakeholders. 
internally and externally to launch that strategy and really start to build that in into business as usual and into our day jobs of of you know project team members so the focus of that strategy i guess overall has been sort of centered around a few different areas understanding where our carbon uh, hotspots are and um, how we might be able to reduce those hotspots throughout a project's life and then recording our sort of carbon data as a result of that um, another big piece of work which has been done since the festival has been around understanding exactly where our hotspots are and we've undertaken a big baseline activity which has essentially reviewed the last five years worth of investment data to try and identify our big areas where we are we've got opportunities to reduce our carbon um, having engaged with other water companies in the wider infrastructure and utility sector sort of throughout the last couple of years you know we weren't surprised to find that ours are very similar to other other companies concrete and steel to name two or two very big um very big areas where we have the opportunity to make some really equally big uh benefits by reducing the carbon associated with those so we've got an area of our strategy which is going to focus specifically on those baseline big hitters and look to try and make some really significant steps forward to driving the carbon out of those areas um, and having a proportionally really big effect from our embodied emissions and our capital uh, projects going forward. Um, the engagement piece isn't just going to sort of end with a strategy being rolled out, people being told about it and that's it. We want to really empower everybody within the business to know that they have a big part to play in their respective areas to reduce carbon. So something that we've been trying to um, get our heads around is how we can kind of take this as a strategy drafted by a few people into sort of the living day to day for, for many. And we're looking to engage with people um, through a network of carbon champions who will really be able to take this forward in their day to day roles to really drive this out and be those ambassadors for, for the climate and be those ambassadors that will drive this net zero strategy forward and, and help us reach our targets in that area. So hopefully that's been a sort of not so rambly summary of a lot of work that um, has gone on since then. It's been like I say, you know, myself and Moira here presenting this today, but it has been a really big team effort um, from a lot of different people. So uh, really excited to see where this goes. I think we've got some we've got some fantastic opportunities here. We've done a lot of work to understand those opportunities and now it's getting to the to the good part where we can start to really drive these forward so um thanks very much that's a bit of a, a summary for us so i'll hand back to you angela thank you very much uh, ben and moira uh fantastic that uh that the work that you're doing is is really got a lot of thinking in it so we can really drive forward some changes in an area that is absolutely definitely needing some big changes for the future so really exciting to see uh to see how that comes to life so thank you very much for that so we're going to switch gears a little bit here. So we've heard from uh, from the asset um, based sprints now. So now we're moving into the uh, the people area. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren Briggs, who's going to share more about the Challenge 22 sprint. Thank you, Angela. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm here to provide an update on the Challenge 22 sprint um, in the people power bubble. We were also known as the Pink Hoodie team. So if anyone remembers, um, about six people run around the festival in pink hoodies. That was the Challenge 22 team. Um, so just as a bit of a reminder, our sprint, um, which was in collaboration with Wood, who are now WSP, um, it was looking at why, how we can make the water industry a more exciting place to work um, through innovation and, and diversity as well. So we, in our sprint, we explored the themes around why people join stay and leave the water sector. And from our findings, we, we recognise that diversity played a really, really big part in that um, and that the industry has quite a long way to go in terms of how diverse that we are. Um, so as we were tackling such a broad topic, I think we actually came out with four really big ideas um, from our sprint, but the one that we landed on, which um, we thought would be the most impactful was Guaranteed Futures. So Guaranteed Futures is basically an initiative proposing to engage with two or three schools in diverse catchment areas and having members of the water sector. So, you know, people from North Indian Water, people from WSP um, and many others who would go into schools to mentor kids, to mentor apprentices and graduates and really open them up to the many possible roles that we have in the industry um, and actually recruit a number of them into our companies um, and into our industry. 
and importantly, without the need for an application or an interview. So it's it's basically guaranteeing them a job and the future. Um, and I don't think we've got Andy Wallace on the call from WSB. I think he was going to come and talk about how it was inspired, but I'll cover his bits. I think he's quite busy um, and wasn't able to make it, unfortunately. But um, I think the idea was hugely inspired by the fact that there is such a good variety of jobs that we have on offer in the industry. And that's you know across the consultants that we work with, with the contractors, clients, manufacturers, et cetera. But that comes with a huge lack of awareness of, the, of those roles. Um, and much like myself, you know, I I just fell into the water sector and I think that was a common theme that we found um, in our tent. So this idea would sort of create those possible career paths which may not otherwise have been considered um, by that sort of that age group. So where are we now with our idea? Um, I'm very pleased to say that we have been given granted some funding to kickstart the project. Um, so what I would say is we're not as far ahead as some as some of the other great ideas that we've heard about today in terms of our progress, um, but the wheels are certainly in motion. So we're currently forming a project team um, and our first step is to kind of identify those schools that we would like to start to work with and start to build a relationship with. Um, and I know that there were, you know, a number of people within our tent and outside of our tent who were really keen to get involved with, with our project. So if that sounds like you, um, we'll be reaching out to people who, you know, were participants in our sprint. So, you know, at that point, make sure to engage us and, and we'll be sure to involve you in our first session. And I think, excuse me, we have considered quite a few of the big obstacles and the, and the risks um, that would come with such a big idea. Um, and I think one of them is, is, you know, considering our engagement with the schools is how much take up are we going to get um, with the schools and with the kids? Are they going to have the same levels of excitement that we have? Um, and then also looking at, you know, where and who will open up the roles for us to make that commitment and um, that there is a guaranteed job at the end of the process. So I think ourselves and the other people who will be involved in the industry will need to work with, you know, HR departments and, and workforce workforce planning um, to make sure that we've got those rules at the end of it. And I think, you know, if anyone's seen the American office with Steve Carell and one very cringeworthy episode <laughs> where he makes a very ambitious and empty promise to pay for a whole class's tuition um, in college when they're aged about five. And I think by the time that they were ready to go off to college, um, he had to share the awful news that he just couldn't pay for their tuition and ultimately ruined their hopes and dreams. So that's something that we definitely don't want to happen here. So we need to make sure that we've got the rules and the jobs at the end of it for, for you know, where we're mentoring the kids to, to get that really good result for them. So we're currently working through those sort of obstacles and risks, but as I said, it's very, very early days, but we're really excited to get the wheels in motion. Um, I think it's a really active approach to us helping our communities and helping our sector on the whole as well. And I think this will bring people into our sector that have typically not really considered it before um, and hence bring in a more diverse way of thinking as well. So really excited. And I think that's about it I have in terms of an update. So I'm happy to pass back to you, Angela. Thank you, Lauren. Um, fantastic uh, work in the sprint. You were certainly a very lively sprint uh, and really brought your passion and energy. And that was infectious uh, across the site, which is great to see. Uh, also, very, very important topic, as you said, I also was one of these who accidentally came into the water sector um, and we definitely want to make it more of a destination than perhaps it is currently. So uh, I really look forward to seeing uh, how this this can bear some fruit and how we can make a difference. So now we're going to be moving on to the uh, I can't uh, get you out of my head sprint and I'm going to be handing over to John. Uh, Burlero, I think, is going to kick this one off for us. Yep, thanks, Angela. Um, so the, the Can't Get You Out of My Head sprint was led by myself, Julie Dodd and Emma Jennings. And what I'll do before we get to where we've got to with this sprint is just paint you a picture of what the sprint was about. So this was all about those little gems of information best practice, how people make judgments, how we make critical decisions and the information we use to make those and how that's passed on to other people in the company. So we, we all we all know that people are going to retire one day. Some people are 40 and 45 years service 
and these people are leaving without passing some of that knowledge on that's incredibly useful for, to people just starting out in their careers. So to, to get us off on a good start to this, we invited Jim Howie in and Jim Howie gave us a little bit of a case study just to paint this picture for us. And Jim said there were a number of his team coming up for retirement age and there's more colleagues due to promotion and due to changing roles and things like that going to be leaving his team in the next couple of years. And what Jim said, and this staggered us, was that almost a third of his team could possibly leave in the next two years, which amounted to 1,950 years of service. And that's staggering. And can you imagine that amount of knowledge leaving your team? So, and the majority of those colleagues can leave with four weeks notice. And, and this is really one of the things that's driving this knowledge transfer need. Um, we've tried previous knowledge transfer systems in the past and they've worked fine, but all rely on human intervention people updating them and you can imagine that's probably not people's priorities when they've got a lot going on in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so what we were told on this by several of the people in the sprint right at the beginning was the opposite to the direction we thought we'd go in. We thought we'd end up probably with a technology solution for this and we were told right at the beginning of the sprint, no, we don't want a technology solution, we want a series of interventions that's going to help us to pass knowledge on through the company. And to help us do this, we took insight from a number of people. We invited a strategist in who from memory, I think was the director of the biggest technical city being built in the world at the moment. And he told us innovation wasn't invention. Innovation's about finding ways to do new things with technology you current have, currently have. So that really changed our way of thinking and perspective on this. And there was a, a lot of updating of slides after the first day in prep for the second day. Um, we, talk, we invited a psychologist in and a psychologist talked about asking people the question, what's going to motivate them to pass knowledge on? Because you can imagine as people are coming up to retirement, that's not their priority probably. Their priority is what they're going to do when they retire. So what motivates them? Um, we, we had colleagues speak as well and we also invited uh, external contributors in as well. We had academics, students, people from local authorities people from other water companies, people from the CBI. So a real mixed bag in this sprint, which gave us a lot of uh, diversity and variety. And I'll hand over to Julie there. Thanks, John. So there was a lot of insight that came out of those good conversations with such a diverse group of people. Uh, some of the, th the kind of three key areas that came out uh, in terms of penny drop moments was actually, is there a difference between how we support people to transfer knowledge when the situation they're looking at is planned or when, when people are starting to deal with unplanned situations? And what that led us to is that it wasn't just about knowledge, it was about people's judgment and how they deal with different situations. It was about behaviours um, and it was about skills as well. So it was much broader than what we initially thought. Um, so some of the in, uh, interesting thoughts that came around was actually how do we move from uh, ownership of knowledge to stewardship of knowledge? So actually part of people's individual responsibilities was to, to uh, train and develop others. Um, and how do we make it as easy as possible and to the point where actually transferring knowledge is business as usual. So it happens all of the time. It happens every day in all of the jobs that people do. Um, and that led us to lots of different ideas um, that spread right across the colleague journey from people joining us all the way through to people leaving the organisation. Um, so the first thing that the team did on the day was think about what is a knowledge journey? What does that look like? So actually, how do we identify the roles that are really important and that require uh, us to kind of think about for the future? And then actually, how do we understand the knowledge that is retained within that in order to know what's valuable and what is priority. Then how do we identify the recipients of that knowledge? Uh, understand the gap between where they are now and, and actually the knowledge that they need to learn. And then how do we actually do the transfer um, and finally evaluate that that transfer has been successful? And, you know, we, we're we already doing lots of this in different ways around the business when we break it down into different uh, parts. Um, but there are ways that we can improve all of those things. So, for example, how we identify those roles. So thinking about our kind of business planning, understanding what our requirements are in the future and understanding what are the critical roles that we may lose in the next kind of three to five years. So thinking about how we do that consistently across the directorates. Um, identifying the knowledge. 
Uh, John will talk about some of those technical ideas about how we came up with doing that, but also thinking about interviewing and documenting uh, uh, the information that we get from our experienced colleagues. Uh, the recipients of that knowledge, we've thought about our apprenticeships and how we utilise and use them differently, and I'll come on to talk about that in a moment. Um, but uh, if, if, for example, in our recruitment, thinking about those people who could uh, have the potential to fulfill roles for the future. So not just thinking about people who already come with that experience, but actually what does potential look like and then how do we uh, transfer that knowledge over? Um, Thinking about understanding how we transfer knowledge, we've considered about learning styles and how do we understand actually what works best for people because not everyone will learn and, and, and um, take knowledge in the same way. And then finally, uh, thinking about that process of assessment. So again, thinking about apprenticeships as an example, how do we assess and understand whether or not knowledge has been transferred over? So that was the knowledge journey. And then within that, there were some key ideas. So for example, making it business as usual, uh, utilising our connect conversations so that we talk about what does development mean for you in your role, um, what are your thoughts about the future, um, and then thinking about how do, how do we kind of build a development plan for our colleagues in order to make that work. Uh, motivation, how do we motivate colleagues to transfer knowledge? Then thinking about our reward and recognition processes. So again, um, our, our new uh, recognition process that's coming in shortly. Uh, we need to educate our managers to, to be thinking about and rewarding colleagues um, for those opportunities where they have been able to transfer knowledge. Um, and then that identity in, in business planning, uh, uh, one of the solutions for next year, speaking specifically of the team that John mentioned earlier, is that we have we know we have 16 colleagues who are who may or may not be um, moving on. So we're working with that area and with the business partner of that area to start building a plan in quarter one next year to think about actually what is the key skills and knowledge that we need to uh, utilise from these colleagues. Um, we are thinking about building a rotational apprenticeship so that when the colleagues come in, uh, they gain and gather knowledge in one area of that uh, business area and then they move around and they um, become a more flexible uh, attribute so that we don't have colleagues from one specific area who then can only stay in that area so that they become a much more flexible uh, colleague where we're able to adapt and it's also great for their uh, learning and skills. So uh, that uh, we will pilot that in one area of the business. We will think about that colleague journey as we do that and build that through. Um, and then we can evaluate that, which parts of that evaluation process. And then once we've done that, build a best practice guide that we can share with the rest of the business so that they can duplicate uh, that process of transferring knowledge. So we'll understand how that worked and then build that best practice guide so the, the rest of the business are able to duplicate in the future. We also had some technological solutions and um, which I'll hand back to John to talk about as well, which will help us capture some of that knowledge. Thanks, John. Thanks, Julie. So on, on the technical side of it, um, we started by talking to a company or um, two and Telefonica about remote headsets, and th these were actually something we were really excited about. Um, and these are headsets that can strap onto a helmet. Um, it has a mini camera down here, which, which expands the sight of vision by about seven times. So you can actually read procedures on them, standard operating procedures. You can watch educational videos on them, but you can also use them to record what you're doing to pass that knowledge and information on to other people. However, um, as excited as we were, there were issues with them. So we couldn't get the headsets to link to people's profiles. We had login issues with them. Some people were saying when they had to look at the screen and then look longer distance, they were starting to feel a bit bilious and a little bit ill, a little bit like travel sickness, for instance. And there were no SIM cards in the headsets yet as well. That's a piece of technology that uh, O2 and Tele Telefonica are currently working on. So we were losing connectivity in the field as well. So we then had to, to pass that back to them and ask them to come back to us when that technology had been updated and worked on and was more, more successful. And we've now moved on to using body cam harnesses. So currently in the field at the moment, um, we're trialing body cam harnesses. And these are the harnesses. If you've ever watched the program on debt collectors, these are the ones the debt collectors wear that strap around them and have the mobile phone on the front taking films. And these are much more cost effective, um, around £45 each compared to 2K plus for, for the remote headsets. To hold your own mobile phone, you can log in on Teams and have a conversation with someone while you're doing it. You can record that 
and you can actually use these to record best practice and knowledge. You can use them when you're managing an incident. You can use them for do, creating a piece of training equipment out in the field. Again, a few issues with them. We struggled near pumps and things for people to be able to hear using these. So we're now experimenting with ear pods as well. Um, and the Teams link was great, but probably a bit basic. So we now we're talking to a company called Vintelligence, who I believe are working quite extensively with the asset at the moment as well. And what they're able to create for us are digital learning videos. So we would imagine we wanted to video how to take the ideal sample. We would give Vintelligence a process flow. They'd break that down into a, a, an app and we would be able to ask a question, then video the solution to that, which let, lets us create al almost a perfect learning video from that. So we have a, a meeting with Vintelligence later in the month to create those videos. And if we can that link, link that in with the body harnesses, we can then start creating a library of, of learning content throughout the company. And that's where we got to with technology. Thanks very much. Uh, back to you, Angela. Thank you. A very, again, a very comprehensive update. Great to see that so much work has been going on since the festival. So uh, look forward to seeing this. And it just goes to show you don't necessarily need the big high tech inventions in order to uh, to come up with a great solution. So uh, loving the, uh, the the more agile approach. Uh, that's fantastic. So now we're going to move swiftly on to Erin Price, who's just going to give a quick update on the work that she's been doing on an off what bid that sprung out of a previous festival. Yes, thank you, Angela. So just one final update on the people um, uh, power bubble. Really excited to say that we are working on a bid with a company called Carafe. And um, so it's an awful innovation fund bid and it builds on all the work that was done on the Challenge 22 sprint that Lauren talked about. So the bid is around how we attract a diverse workforce into the water industry. So people often say that the water industry is the world's best kept secret because we have so many great jobs. We have a real sense of purpose and this is what our bid is all around. So it's looking at that attraction campaign. What's really important to people about the organisation that they work for. There's loads of research around that. Organisations that are sustainable, that have a true sense of purpose and meaning in the work that they do. And we'll make sure that our campaign speaks to people who want to work in the water industry and they can find out more about what types of roles are available. So we um, submitted a bid last year um, and we weren't successful. And I think this just goes to show that we can learn from that. We can take on board that feedback and come back better and stronger this year. So the bid goes in in December. We will all keep you posted on how we get on with that so that we can build on the great work that was done on this year's sprint. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Erin. And it just goes to show that the road isn't always linear and ends in uh, fruit straight away. So uh, great tenacity and perseverance in a very, very uh, important space. So fingers crossed for this time. Uh, great to hear that. So now I'm going to hand over to Kay and Manisha to wrap up the session. But I've been absolutely bowled over by all of the great progress and all the hard work that's gone on since the festival. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. And I'm going to hand over to Manisha. Thank you, Angela. I think this has been a fantastic session. And I, as much as I'd want to talk about the people side of things as well, I won't steal Kay's thunder. But from an assets point of view, I hope, you know, our viewers can see there's a lot of work that's gone into this, not just by the teams, but by our partners. And, you know, the work that we're doing is 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 groundbreaking. It's game changing. You know, when we look at the health of our assets, how we're going to manage that, how we're going to get them to be more to be more predictive and, and be more resilient in the services that we provide and just managing our investments and also the inter intergenerational impacts that we can have. Um, sewer, sewer, the HMS sewer piece in terms of understanding the asset base that we hold and sort of really harnessing the different types of technology to get all of that. And you know, carbon culture, um, Ben mentioned the, the climate crisis. This is, is absolutely what it is and we need to really change cultures and behaviours and what the guys are doing around that space. Nobody has rested on their laurels since the uh, since the innovation event, even prior to that. Uh, so I'm really pleased and uh, we hope to keep you guys informed as to how we progress with our different bids and progress that we make on each of these projects. Thanks and I'll pass you on to Kay. Thank you, Monisha. And I'm equally um, uh, bold over. We, we obviously are, um, we have got a lot more to do. Um, 
but if we can solve some of these issues, particularly around how do we how do we make ourselves the sexiest place on earth to come and work? Um, we of course we feed all of this um, further, don't we? If we've got the best people, then and when we've got the best people, and we know we've already got the um, uh, the best people, but we've got some more best people. Um, of course, we can be more innovative and we can solve more problems, and it sort of feeds it um, feeds itself. So, what I would like to do uh, is to um, offer my thanks on behalf of all all of us for our speakers today. We've heard from Ken, Steve, Moira, Ben, Lauren, Ju John, Julie. Um, and they are just the tip of the iceberg. We've got lots and lots and lots of other people who are, are busy working on um, on all of these things. So very, very big thanks to everybody who's got involved in all of these sprints. Onwards and upwards, everybody. We can't wait to hear the next epistle on how you're, um, how you're doing uh, on your various sprints and I new ideas. Uh, for those of you that have listened in, thank you very much for joining us today. We've we've been really uh, pleased about uh, to have you. If you want to hear more, uh, please will you have a look at the Innovation Connect newsletter, um, which Angela and her team are um, very diligent and, and putting out and always contain lots and lots of, of um, thrilling information. And um, I think I can also say that the final on-call session is this coming Friday and will be on Smart Tech. So from that, I think I'm I'm handing back to you, Angela. You can, but this session is now a close. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we'll keep you in touch with uh, how we uh, bring these wonderful projects to fruition. Thank you.